Hi, welcome to the uh, February 21st meeting of the CNCF IoT Edge Working Group. Uh, for today's meeting, I see one item on the um, agenda document. And um, as usual, if we run out of prearranged items, we'll uh, switch to just uh, birds of a feather discussion on Edge IoT, cloud native, edge native, and whatever people want to talk about. The item that's on the agenda is uh, tag runtime booth lightning talk. So I missed the last meeting, but I assume somebody here is prepared to deliver this lightning talk. Unless this was a discussion of prepping such a lightning talk. I can add some context. Um, I'm not sure who put it on. It might've been Dehan. Um, but uh, essentially, the runtime tag has a booth at KubeCon, and they're giving lightning talks there, I believe. And I, Dehan's been linked into the loop of that with other working group leads, because he's going to be there about participating in that lightning talk and maybe sharing something like our latest white paper during that lightning talk. OK, that sounds good. Uh, Dehan isn't here, but I've been to cube cons and seeing similar things go on. So for anybody not familiar, I think it's pretty open-ended as long as what you're going to deliver isn't some kind of commercial sales pitch. Um, you can feel free to put just kind of the standard items that we might discuss at these meetings. Um, is there anybody on the call now who is going to be there? I'll take the silence as a no. I suppose um, even if you weren't going to be there, you could probably put together some kind of script and ask somebody who is to deliver it. Well, that's it for the uh, things on the agenda. So I guess we're switching over to birds of a feather. So anybody who's come across anything they want to announce or um, anything they've encountered uh, that's interesting in the last month or so, or anything else uh, applicable to the group, go for it. Hey, Steve, I just added in the uh, chat, in the issue we had on the uh, tag runtime GitHub, I added the link to the, uh, to the latest white paper we did to that issue. Um, so if we, Kate, I think you had mentioned putting a reference to that in a working group GitHub or something, and then we can probably close out that issue at this point. That's just a uh, housekeeping. Okay, that sounds good. I transferred it out of the chat into the agenda notes doc, and cool. that sounds like a good plan. That's a good reminder, Joel. So essentially, we want to, in that GitHub issue, add a link to the finalized paper. Yeah, I did that. If you go look at when you get a chance, if you look at the issue, it's right at the bottom. Uh, the link I got from a uh, Brandon. Okay, and so is the idea to have this paper checked into the check in the PDF of it, or what is our what other way do we want to add it to the uh, repository? I'm open to anything. <laughs> Okay, I, it sounds like this. Were you just saying this was an announcement? Basically, like we can close that issue. Like we have yeah, the edge native application. Just, here, I just put it in the chat. Here, there's a CNCF blog post, and the white paper is posted to the CNCF page. Um, so that's effectively published, right? Um, and then, Kate, I think we're waiting for that to get published or that CNCF post uh, to figure out what to do next. 
Like, I, don't know, I, I think putting a link in the um, working group, GitHub, readme, or what, uploading the PDF, um, I think those are all great options. What if we, um, inside the working group subfolder, white paper subfolders, we add um, a markdown file that says um, edge native application design behaviors, and all the markdown contains is the link to these two things. Cool. And we could even update the first white paper to have a link to where it's published as well. But um, I'm open to also updating the IoT Edge Working Group Charter with our white paper, a list of our white papers if we want. Yeah, Kate, that sounds like a good idea to me. Okay, cool. I'll do that um, uh, today. Get, get that in the repository. Okay, along the lines of things that you might have come across recently that seemed interesting, I'm going to post in the chat a link to this uh, tiny ML uh, summit meeting that's coming up in April. Let's see. It's in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, April 22 and 24. So it's a couple days. They already appear to have the agenda and speakers listed. And I've never gone to one of these, but I've um, I went to a couple local tiny ML meetups, and I've attended some of their online uh, Zoom sessions, and they've all been quite good. So this is an organization that covers um, AI and machine learning running at edge. Um, it's kind of open and all over the map in terms of how that might be delivered. Anything from something containerized to something running strictly uh, on an embedded device, um, you know, with a local uh, embedded appropriate operating system. But anyway, if that's of interest to anyone, um, the link is in the chat and uh, have a look. I noticed going back into some of those meetings I missed that there's been some discussion on arranging for uh, particular speakers and I was wondering if anybody's had um, any luck on follow-up for those, or if we're still looking for somebody to go pursue speakers for upcoming meetings? I think that sounds like a great idea. One of the things I was mulling over in my head is what sort of overlap we have with other groups in the CNCF, particularly the TAG Runtime Group. They've been getting a lot of speakers that are making um, special purpose Linux container-based operating systems. Um, do we do we want to also try to appeal to some of those folks, or do we want to go in the other direction and try to get speakers about like um, Cube Edge and and the larger system like um, projects? Uh, I think we could do both. No. Some of those um, projects like CubeEdge have their own uh, working groups running. So, uh, you know, they, they went under the CNCF. So I think they are running their own meetings at a monthly cadence. I suspect that on an annual basis, they'd probably be willing to come here and touch base and give us updates. Kind of the ones I've found more interesting since, you know, some of these projects that have their own running group, 
obviously function only on that. But one of the ones that I've, the, the meetings I've found that are most interesting are kind of the uh, compare and contrast of those things. You know, sort of from an end user perspective, if you were out there seeking an edge optimized Kubernetes, you, you'd, you'd still have a lot of work uh, in front of you if you watched the presentations on those individual projects one at a time as compared to a comparison. Now there's a lot of work in a comparison and it probably, you know, has the potential to get controversial whenever you uh, line up aspects of competitive things, whether they're commercial products or open source projects. But still, I think there'd be a lot of value in that. Now, the closest I think we've come to that is maybe um, the, the person from the uh, Eclipse Foundation, Frederick, has done some presentations on some of those. And once you got in, there's this realm of things that are certified uh, distributions of Kubernetes, like CubeEdge, but then there are some that are make no attempt to be a full featured Kubernetes, you know, kind of like um, the feature in, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the project at this time, but the Portainer project that pro host container run times, but provides only a subset of the Kubernetes API. And in some contexts, that's probably a perfectly valid and maybe even desirable thing to do if it lowers the resource footprint. But maybe a, a session kind of doing an overall um, wrap up on all the things that are <laughs> Kubernetes like out there, uh, I think would be of great value. I don't know of anybody off the shelf that uh, has done such a recent comparison. So maybe this is a task for somebody or some group of people to put it together. And I suppose if you did put, put such a thing together, it would also be a great talk to go on the conference circuit, not just to uh, do at one of our meetings. Kind of along the same lines, but I think maybe meriting its own meeting and or presentation would be comparing Kubernetes for Edge with some other form of orchestrator for Edge, you know, like Nomad. And uh, you can go do a Google search and find some of these things, I think, but there should be sell-by dates on any of these technology presentations and a topic like that probably spoils within a year or 18 months so that um, on a recurring basis, it's probably worthwhile to go and revisit that because things just don't stay the same. You know, Kubernetes now isn't what it was 18 months ago. And I kind of suspect the same applies to Nomad or any other solution. So just about the topic, just, just the charter for this group, uh, the way I feel it, it, this group is not um, like, uh, not like product specific, like Steve, when you said um, Cube Edge, uh, mm -hmm. that's very specific to uh, one particular project. So the advantage for this group is to cover everything. Um, there's several things um, uh, I feel that so one thing that Kate has been going through is the some WebAssembly stuff, pretty interesting. Um, of course, I'm a hands-on part. I haven't maybe because I'm using Windows, I didn't have luck with that. Um, but I think Lian also mentioned that it's possible to bring um, actually Liam just joined so um, some TM forum uh, folks to give a talk about WebAssembly. Um, uh, at use cases. I think that's all interesting. Uh, another part I feel that's uh, going to be interesting to talk is um, uh, Joe. I uh, did invite him. He's uh, one of the TS, um, uh, uh, one of the main guy in the uh, TF Edge community. Uh, he actually published a, a book. I'm reading it. It's um, very, at least for me, it's very useful because it just gave me a lot of uh, ground knowledge about edge computing from, from ground up. So do you think it'd be interesting if we just as a filler, other than presentations and things, can we 
maybe use that like a book as a kind of book club at the same time. Whenever there's nothing else, we can go through that and go over the best practices. And sure, the, or the maybe stack. we can recruit. Could you post a link to that book? Because it sounds interesting to me. And yeah, maybe we could even recruit the book's author. Yeah, he, he's um, he actually agreed to give a talk sometime. To, he, he likes to. So he, I actually had a one on one discussion with him about the edge computing landscape and all that. Um, he actually think it's really interesting to collaborate because the Earth Edge focused on the application of edge. Um, use cases, right? So they're very they're closer to the overall to the to the actual uh, user than than this group. Uh, whereas C and CF edge is more of the fundamentals, like what's new, right? So, but those two separated. In the past, it might have a reason for that, but really, there's a you know it, it, there's a disconnect there because new things here may not always be propagated downstream to the air edge. And same thing, maybe maybe some use cases that. Airfedge is aware of that's not known in this in this uh, domain. So, yeah, I think there could be some interesting um, communication of uh, knowledge uh, there. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a book um, link to the to the Zoom. It's in the, already in the Slack channel, but I'll put it here as well. Yeah, and I think you mentioned Joe that. Um... I, sorry, Victor, about Joe speaking, and um, he's in the Slack. And I, I guess to follow up on that, do you want? one of the chairs to reach out to him directly about when to schedule that talk or do you was he going to reach out um to one of us yeah i mentioned that. i was going just to let you know <laughs> just introduce him to 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 you so this is your organizer um but he already self introduced so i asked him to provide a um description of the book and and a kind of bio for himself he has not responded i know he's quite busy as well so um yeah, I guess we can follow up on Slack and see when he's available. And I know he mentioned interest in coming to the meeting. I thought, I think he thought the meeting was last week. Um, and so I could see him coming to a future meeting as an attendee as well. But um, I can, we can also like start a conversation with him on the book. And um, yeah, it's been great to have these kind of references to have a conversation around too. Yeah, they, they they definitely have done a lot of uh, edge cases actual involvement uh, I don't know it's consulting or actual implementation um, yeah so if you, if you read the book there are quite a few topics I think could be fillers whenever there's nothing you know, no presenter here I think it'll be good to go through that book actually if you have a copy now feel free to go through it now if you like Yeah, it's a. Um, I think cannot log in from here. Yeah, I, I shared the link on the on the on the. Okay. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I think um, we haven't talked about in a while is all the different lightweight Kubernetes options that are out there, mm -hmm. um, including things like the non Kubernetes orchestrators, like Nomad that you referenced before, Steve. Yeah. Something that came up um, just earlier this year were the fact that Eclipse has started getting involved in that space through their software-defined vehicle work. And they actually have multiple orchestrators. There's the Eclipse Canto, which seems to be focused on IoT-type devices and can include Kubernetes as long, alongside of other um, options for container management. But then they also have, and we can not be able to pronounce this, Eclipse and chaos, which is specifically for the automotive case, where they're trying to deal with um, safety critical uh, certification constraints, as well as footprint constraints. Um, so there may be some interesting things to learn from that angle as well. And I put the links in the chat. Okay, sounds good. I think one thing that's interesting when discussing um, orchestrator for the edge on whether Kubernetes, for example, or Nomad, is I think there's two parts of the consideration. One is which is better for what your needs and the other is which is better for adoptability. Like if you're doing it for your own in-house needs, 
um, you might be able to be more specific and use Nomad. Um, but if you're doing something that uh, you need to be able to hand the reins over, people are so familiar with the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, and so that's part of an interesting part of the conversation. But um, we found that Nomad is really nice because it has a concept of more than scheduling containers, you can schedule tasks essentially. So those could be just system processes and that's really helpful for edge scenarios too. Yeah, I mean, the most famous Nomad user is probably Roblox, you know, um, uh, with their, um, you know, they famously run, you know, they're all their global data centers on Nomad and not Kubernetes. Um, although they had a very highly publicized outage a few years ago. Um, that uh, they walk through a really painful public um, uh, a discussion. Again, I think the problem um, quickly emerges um, in, you know, your definition of the edge. You know, if your definition of the edge is, you know, a, uh, is, uh, you know, a Raspberry Pi or embedded Linux, um, Nomad's not a great um, option. If your definition of the edge is a small data center, then um, Nomad, I think, is is a good option um, that that gets on there. So I think we we come back to again this question of of the service weight and um, you know the desired multi tenancy and you know tenants you know units of tenancy that were that there's this you know table here of um, you know uh, architecture you know uh, you know you know full PCs data. Uh, and then multi-tenancy that you're sort of like pivoting through um, all the way down towards like at the far end, you've got embedded and not multi-tenant. And at the top end, you've got, you know, full data center and um, embedded or, you know, and uh, and multi-tenant and multi-system. So that that I think is where that nuance really comes in. I like that way of thinking about edge. And I don't think we've talked about it that way before as it's not just about size, but it's also about tenancy. And I think that's important to think about in part because if it's a multi-tenant environment, you also need to think about isolation. Well, if we're talking about an embedded device that it's just running its own firmware, essentially that conversation changes a little. Um, so I think that's interesting to think about the edge as being a spectrum of tenancy as well. Yeah. My, my own theory on this is is that you know kubernetes is just a way station on the way towards you know um, a wasm specific orchestrator um uh a do or a domain specific orchestrator um if you will um and that's because ultimately WebAssembly components have unique properties um that don't directly map to the original design goals and architecture design of Kubernetes. The reason to start with Kubernetes today, and if you look, you know, we're heavily invested in it, and so are, is every other Wasm player, is you, know, you start where your people are today and you let take advantage of all the investments and control systems and yada, 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 all the, all the things that let you begin where people are. But where things are going is, you know, if you look inside of like CNCF Wasm Cloud, for example, there's an application spec and it's an application spec that leverages the unique properties of WebAssembly components in order to let you compose software. Those concepts don't translate to the fundamental tenancy of Kubernetes because Kubernetes is really built around um, a higher level um, concept. So there's just a, only a certain level of translation that you can, you can do. And we wrote an article that um, about, you know, the sort of like um, current ways of embedding, you know, the uh, ways of uh, even running inside of Kubernetes. There's even different approaches. There's, you know, people that are basically making like um, building it into the kubelet and, you know, using that approach. And there's the approach that we're taking Wasm Cloud, which is running it inside of a container. And the reason why we're doing that and, you know, creating CRDs and stuff like that, and the reason why we're doing that is, um, you know, it gives you just, it lets you use different features of WebAssembly in a WebAssembly native way. One lends itself more of a FAS concept because you're taking WebAssembly and then putting it into the construct of Kubernetes. Uh, and what we're trying to do is really highlight and make available that whole broad range of 
things that you can do in um, in WebAssembly. And they're just different approaches that highlight different value propositions of of the of the new technology. Edge is, is most confusing. Uh, just the pillar of landscape is very confusing. Uh, that's why I like the Joe's book. It, it, it kind of sort of a, I don't know, it's a universally agreed way of categorizing edge computing, but at least going into a lot of details on do, doing that. So uh, for example, um, things I'd like to learn actually is uh, like, for example, WebAssembly. Uh, when you run on a on a uh, resource constrained, um, uh, I mean, of course you don't you want to use containers there, uh, but uh, what is the benefit of uh, having an operating system versus uh, you know um, running uh, just is it possible to run it embedded without operating system, for example, on a on a constrained device? Um, just is, is that a possibility? Uh, for WebAssembly. So without running in a container, without running an yeah. operating system, without yeah, running right. a browser, uh, yeah, can you sure. just yeah. Yeah. run well, it? Yeah. Whammer, Whammer is the most popular embedded distribution. Um, the distribution that Kate and I both leverage, she works on an open source distribution called uh, Spin, and I work on an open source cloud native project called Wasm Cloud. We both use an engine called Wasm Time. Um, which is created by the Bytecode Alliance um, that does run on Linux. Um, uh, Whammer is really designed to be embedded into, you know, like um, like embedded software. So to think like, you know, where you have a C compiler that compiles down to some, you know, I don't know if like a pick, but, you know, uh, some smaller microcontroller or something like that. And Whammer is also in the Bytecode Alliance. Thank you, Kate. There's a great link there that um, that links out where it's supported. You don't you don't need a operating system to run a. That's correct. Oh, and okay. Sony, we had talked about this before. Sony did agree to uh, uh, to come and present what they're doing. They're a Whammer user, and um, but we and I pointed them at the schedule and asked them to add themselves, but they haven't done that yet. I I'll revisit with them and see if I can just get them to pick a specific meeting and try to shepherd that. Um, uh, a little bit um, of that presentation, uh, but they're an embedded uh, user that has been out at they you know they showed up at the last KubeCon. They had a great booth and they talked a lot about what they're doing. You know they've even created um, uh, some silicon like a CPU for running ML on um, on hardware using WebAssembly in an embedded context, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, from that perspective, it's baked into their cameras and stuff. Um, uh, and they, that was just what they had in their booth and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, now there is, um, some maybe definition needed, you know, Whammer still on, um, WebAssembly modules, not WebAssembly components. So they haven't yet adopted the, I would say what the latest standards are. But I think there is alignment that they are heading in that direction to adopt those. Um, it just, you know, there's just some uh, gap in when they when they're going to get there. But yeah, maybe you're not the the foremost authority on Whammer yourself, but maybe you know this. I'm just kind of curious if it provides the ability to run on a non Linux host. Mm -hmm. It still is the common. Uh, challenge and edge that you might be faced with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these that you have to distribute your software out to and keep it maintained. Is there any bridge technology you're aware of that would say, package the WebAssembly things in a container and get it out to these non-Linux nodes? In other words, yeah, there's, handle there's, the pipeline? There's a dozen companies that build, you know, that do that as a um, mm -hmm build that as um uh as their um uh, you know as their uh you know like like what they do um uh goliath.io uh, io is um is a platform builder that i'm familiar with that um it really focuses around a web assembly that's jonathan barry um he's um focused in that space um and uh you know i think that there are a lot of existing prior companies that that do similar sorts of like, you know, we provide the, you know, build, run, deploy, manage firmware lifecycle. 
um, uh, for your devices um, uh, and have integrated WebAssembly into their roadmap. Um, there are lots of other runtimes besides Whammer um, out that work in the embedded space. Uh, but uh, from my awareness and perspective, I feel like Whammer is the dominant one that has the mind share across uh, the big enterprises um, that I see. So like the full, the members in the Bytecode Alliance, um, I see them, you know, sort of, which are like the members are people like Siemens and Bosch and, you know, like the 800 pound gorillas of the embedded world. And I see them coalescing around those tools, at least in their public documents that they talk about. Mm -hmm. I have no internal knowledge or, you know, no product awareness of what they're doing. I'm just just from somebody that has sits through their presentations and reads their websites all the time. That's that's what I feel like I read about the most. Um, so I, I think that uh, if that's the case um, that's out there, you know, uh, a layer above that, you know, if you're on Linux, so think like OpenWRT or, you know, any of any of those kind of things, you know, Wasm Cloud is really uh, trying to fit in that space. Um, you know, obviously that's what I work on. Uh, you know, and that's, you know, we've got our Wasm Cloud Wednesday in 25 minutes here. Um, and we provide an app spec to help you define and scale and orchestrate those apps. Um, and then we support, you know, up and down the spat stack across, you know, compatible with Kubernetes, but not dependent upon. Um, we have had a lot of people ask about uh, embedded um, versions, but we've really um, just stayed in the Linux ecosystem for now uh, uh, for a number of reasons. We think components are the future, and um, that seems to be our, where our sweet spot of our users are, are in enterprise microservices. So that's that's where we are for now. Uh, Kate, I know that you are really deep on this space as well with your background. Is there anything you wanted to add or, or anyone else? Um, I would just point out the slides that we went over the past couple meetings um, in there. It kind of compares the runtimes and we mentioned Whammer there and have the link. So I'll just share that out again. Um, it should be in the meeting notes too, but um, in case like you wanna be able to kind of see a slide-by-side -side comparison of these. And I think the call out of like the limitation of Whammer being one of them being that it doesn't support components is like one to keep in mind if that storyline is interesting to you as it is to both Liam and I's companies. So Rob, I'm interested in your perspective too, uh, seeing you as kind of the authority at, here on the, in this meeting on embedded operating systems in real time as to what's been going on there in terms of support of containerized software as well as WebAssembly software um, in in your space? What, what have you been seeing lately? Um, it's a good question. So I would say that uh, there's a lot of interest in being able to run real-time workloads with containers. Um, it's certainly a question that comes up a lot with the VxWorks containers that we have. Um, the What it comes down to is what the real-time needs are. So in some industries, they have a hard real-time requirement mm -hmm. where if, if it fails to hit the deadline, then the integrity of the entire system is completely gone. Um, but then there are other industries where a firm or a soft real-time requirement is all that's required. Um, and if you miss a deadline, as long as you are able to um, catch up and, and respond to the next incoming request, then you can still maintain quality of service. I'm thinking specifically of like multimedia audiovisual uh, um, industries, where if you drop a frame, that's fine as long as you are able to uh, catch up to the next one. Um, the big challenge is uh, when using things like Linux for real time, being able to tune the system so that you can characterize what those firm or soft real time requirements are. So when you look at groups like um, Elisa, they have various working groups that are focused on aerospace and trying to figure out how to um, characterize real-time performance in containers running on Linux for uh, aerospace and even automotive type systems. 
Um, but a lot of that work is still in progress. Um, we had been trying to uh, come up with a document that described how to tune your Linux system for um, real-time capabilities. But uh, as is true with a lot of things in Embedded, um, because you're the running directly on the hardware, a lot of the guidance and the tuning is very specific to the hardware you're running on. So it's a very slippery fish <laughs> to try to try to catch and nail down. Um, but there's a lot of great ongoing work being done to try to make Linux suitable for soft real-time systems. I suppose another approach, or I can think of a couple. One is to just take advantage of the OCI containers and maybe, you know, not assume that we're talking that the content is a Dockerized application that would require a Linux kernel, but that you're simply using the packaging tooling to send blobs that are appropriate to your deterministic real-time operating system payloads. Another one might that might be applicable in some systems like automotive would be to simply assume that there are coprocessors reachable on some kind of local network, uh, you know, the entertainment system in an automobile, for example, and you're just passing through these payloads to some, some processor that doesn't really have the same constraints as uh, the engine controls or the, anti-lock brake system, for example. And in a way, you're simply a central switchboard that passes through these things to the, the, the places where they're needed. Yeah, that, that's right, exactly. Like um, if you already can guarantee real-time performance, um, then it's completely viable just to use the OCI format as a deployment mechanism. Um, if it's okay for me to share, I can show you some of these options now if you'd like to quickly see them. Sure, let me uh, make you a uh, co-host and then you should be able to share. So I will i won't give the entire presentation, but I'd be happy to jump into it at a future date if people think this would be interesting. But these are those, those options that um, you were just alluding to, Steve. So if you're just looking at normal containers, um, you can, use them to deploy an existing real-time process or even like a kernel module. Um, you could also use them to take um, processes for other systems and then deploy them to another operating system. This has been tried with very with mixed results. This WSL1, uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux 1 tried to run Linux processes on Windows, for example, but then they changed course for WSL2 because there were complications. FreeBSD has be, had the ability to run Linux binaries for quite some time, and they do the system call translation to go into the kernel. So you could go and you could take those applications and bundle them in a container to deploy them. And then the third option would be to try to create some sort of generic API that could be packaged into a container and you could potentially deploy it to multiple operating systems by doing like runtime linking when it finally got deployed to the target. The more interesting ones, I think, are when you start to look into like hardware virtualization and being able, uh, apologies, I don't mean, these just happen to be the PowerPoint slides I have readily available, but you could go and deploy a container using one operating system and actually launch it on another. So if you look to work that uh, Stefano Stabellini is doing with Zen and RunX, uh, that's a great example where you might deploy a um, virtual machine as an OCI container to the DOM zero on Zen, and then actually create a new DOM U guest out of that virtual machine image. And now you've got a whole operating system running on that type one Zen hypervisor. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different options you can pursue. And then you can get into stuff with like, uh, co-kernels like so that's your Zenomai and other things as well as creating a real-time island which I think is the last thing you mentioned Steve where you might yeah. have a physically separate processor and you mm -hmm. might go and start deploying things to that processor and that could either be running an operating system like I show here in the center or it could be 
uh, could be running on um, a bare metal application on a core that's being shielded from the rest of the system so that no interrupts um, interfere with that core and thus affect the uh, real-time performance of any software running on that core. Yeah, this looks like great stuff so long as you're on a um, processor that's rich enough to support hypervisor functions. But I could see even another leading edge application for this of there's a trend of, of silicon supporting these things, enclaves that are secure computing. Uh, effectively, what runs in there is completely encrypted, uh, held in memory so that uh, you know, they're, they're, it really makes it difficult to attack other than kind of keeping the system hot and going in there with logic analyzers on chips. And even then that might be, you you might have to grind the chip open to put probes on it. But uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, leading edge research going on there. And this kind of packaging might be a way to even get things uh, supported uh, not just for enforcing real-time constraints, but enforcing security boundaries as well. Yeah, and and creating those enclaves on a general purpose CPU is, is certainly um, an interesting approach because then you can do things like attestation within those enclaves. There mm -hmm. is also a whole myriad of hardware out there. I won't name any particular semi-vendor, but they all have... Um, boards where there's a main like a series arm chip that's doing that's running linux and doing a lot of your application compute and then they'll have uh, m series or r series um, processors on the side where they might be running your real-time application um, and they don't they don't make use of enclaves these are physically separate chips yeah and and just look at cell phones where they've got multiple chips or even Another scenario would be hardware accelerators for machine learning AI as well, where you, you know, if you're feeling a need to support silicon for AI acceleration at edge, packaging these in OCI as a means of uh, getting full lifecycle support uh, and routing them around to where they're needed within your, your edge leaf node seems like a problem that everyone's likely to have. Yeah, there's there's that whole concept of um, uh, device operators, the container device interface guys have been looking into ways that you can um, have an operator deployed to a device like an NVIDIA um, embedded board or AMD Xilinx board. And then as you probably know, your operator will have the various libraries or tools that are needed to load the bitstream onto an FPGA or to load the CUDA application onto your GPU. And then this um, allows Kubernetes to start deploying uh, containers that have been made specifically for those accelerators and um, automatically have them downloaded to that worker node and um, allow the operator to load that workload onto the accelerator itself. Liam, you have your hand up. Oh, can you yeah. turn here? Yeah, I think the conversation is super interesting. And I think we have really teased out, you know, on that table between, you know, scale Linux and um, embedded, you know, one of the compelling reasons that pulls you towards embedded is that um, a hard real time requirement. Um, I did link one of the, I think one of the higher end uh, boards, like what um, uh, Rob was referring to, where, you know, uh, AMD, um, as Linux has got one of those, you know, makes these boards that have, you know, um, uh, risk uh, real time chips paired with application chips, you can essentially have, um, you know, guest regular management code paired with code that has real time requirements for managing RF sensors or things like that. So those are used in like telco and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but I think what I would take a step back and just observe, you know, that there is, um, uh, you know, a, a little bit of uh, ridiculousness in the scale. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from Adobe, they did a presentation about 
why they were like, why are they even looking at Wasm Cloud? Why do they play with it? You know, why do they invest? And they came to KubeCon a year and a half ago. And essentially the quote was something along the lines of, you know, you can run really well with, um, you can run really well, you can run operationally very well with Kubernetes, but it's hard to do that efficiently um, and cost effectively. And it was this horizontal scale problem as they sort of, you know, went to scale horizontally closer to their users, the cost just escalated dramatically because they couldn't scale to zero and things like that. And if you really sit down and take a step back, you know, most corporate microservices are in Java. So their stack looks like, you know, Java running in a JVM on a container, on Kubernetes, in a virtual machine, on Zen, um, on someone else's real hardware in a virtual cloud. And so it's abstraction and abstraction and abstraction and abstraction, you know, all the way, um, all the way up. And um, and then uh, separately, I linked maybe the last thing, the last comment I would make. If you if you haven't uh, had a chance to watch this talk, the birth and death of JavaScript, um, please do so because it takes this whole concept of what we're sort of circling around here, and it really kind of calls this out and even predicted the rise of WebAssembly, um, where I kind of playfully linked in chat a few minutes ago people that are have ported x86 emulators to Wasm. So, and then NTT is using those to now transpile containers um, uh, to Wasm. So you could even take, um, you know, the stack and run, uh, you know, uh, uh, Java in a JVM in a container um, in, uh, in a virtual machine in Wasm uh, and then in a browser you know, on a stack all the way down and take it, you know, all the way down like recursively. And that's the joke that um, that the speaker makes in this epic talk um, about the birth and death of JavaScript, which is far as what I'm concerned is one of the best talks about software um, ever given. And it's from PyCon in 2014. Um, and it really just goes through this wistful um, joke about um, transpiling of all software becoming, um, uh, JavaScript and I sort of, you know, kind of playfully jokes about transpiling different languages to JavaScript, which is how WebAssembly started. And um, and then suddenly this joke around running OSs and everything in the browser. And it, it's funny to see somebody have that vision and just have that glimpse of the future and share it so eloquently, um, you know, a decade ago, uh, which is now that timeline. Uh, so I would encourage people to watch it if you are familiar if you would like to get some insight um into how this pattern i think just keeps repeating so miss dhtml2 it's old school <laughs> taking me back to 1998 now um as far as like scaling kubernetes is concerned if uh if you guys would be interested in having someone come in and talk about starling x that might be something i could arrange so Starling X is under LF Edge, and it's being used primarily for uh, 5G infrastructure right now, including a number of large uh, service providers that are out there. So it's it's being tried and used in production. But um, let me know if that's something that appeals to you. I, I think it is applicable to this group. Let me ask you something. When you talk about scaling, how big is large or by scale? Is it more Kubernetes cluster nodes that they're doing or is it clusters of Kubernetes clusters? So, so the, the harder requirement would be um, Xeon class systems. So mm -hmm. it's, it's meant to be at the telco edge, not necessarily at the far edge. And those Kubernetes clusters can be in a simplex duplex or normal cluster configuration, you would of course lose the ability for high availability with simplex because if your hardware fails you, you don't have something to fail over to. Um, if you needed the high available configuration, you of course would need two Xeon class servers side by side. So it's either one or two Xeon class servers based on what your requirements are. As um, a minute. If you're looking for federated um, Kubernetes, which has been a huge gap in the market, um, uh, ByteDance just released their tool, KubeAdmiral, if you didn't see it. I think they just released it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they have talked about it and been hinting about it for uh, quite some time. 
Um, I'll link it in chat there, uh, but uh, that is their federation tool that they run at, at I mean, mind boggling scale to federate their Kubernetes deployments. I, I want to say one of the numbers mentioned in here was, you know, um, 10 million pods, um, 100,000 microservices, uh, 30,000 um, upgrade and scaling operations daily. And um, maybe I imagined it, but I thought I um, had read somewhere around 200,000 nodes or something like that, uh, which is, I mean, that's a pretty beefy deployment. Um, that's uh, as big as any of the any of the large deployments that I've ever worked on that were serving, you know, 100 million or you know, 150 million customers. So that's that's gigantic. Um, and actually, in a few, everybody thinks of ByteDance and TikTok. You know, TikTok's one of their smallest products that that, that they that they run. If you dig into into ByteDance, you know, the um, they actually have there's some of their other products are like dwarf the size of TikTok. And you know, in the U.S., that's really all we know about. You know, so um, that's what I would check out, Steve, if you're interested in that space. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because from the very beginning of people trying to do Kubernetes at edge, uh, people had edge nodes that obviously dwarf the published cluster limit of Kubernetes, which unless it's been updated is 5,000 nodes. And 5,000 leaf nodes just... It, is ridiculously small for some large scale edge deployments. So if the answer to that is federating multiple Kubernetes, you've got, you know, you talked about your layers of abstraction, but you just added another one. And uh, even to take Kubernetes to 5,000 can be challenging because some aspects of it, like the etcd, uh, have resource demands that don't scale linearly. And, uh, and they don't scale less than linearly either. So, yeah, this byte dance uh, thing does. Uh, I'll I'll look into it. Thanks. Uh, we've got three minutes left. So, if anybody has gotten any last minute uh, items to bring up or discuss or things that uh, you want to put in the queue for next meeting, now's the time. Okay, uh, I'll take the silence as nothing in the queue. So uh, we'll meet again in a couple of weeks and uh, I hope to see all of you then. Uh, bye. Bye, Ryan. Take care, everyone. Good to see you again, Steve. Sure. Have a great day.